Welcome to another episode of Through the Glass. If you've been tuning in, I appreciate that very much. I'm very excited to have today's guest. He's a great friend, a uh, great guy, entrepreneur, um, just a brother of mine. This is Mark Bennett. He is the owner of Pappy's Barbershop in College Area, San Diego, and Poway, San Diego, and also the owner of San Diego Laser Tattoo Removal Services. So if you made some poor choices and you're on the West Coast, <laughs> maybe you want to get that taken off. What's up, Mark? What's up, brother? It's so awesome to see you. Um, I can't overstate um, how much I love you as a friend and as a uh, just as a, a connection to me spiritually in this world. I can't overstate it. So um, um, anytime you visit Jersey, I'm excited. You're usually on an annual visit, mm -hmm. which is awesome. Pre-COVID annual, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. But now you're back in it. Yeah. Um, even though I guess we're still sort of in the ravages of, of this mess. But um, I'm glad you came out. Came out solo without your uh, wife and kids. I hate right. you. <laughs> you're the only guy I know who still gets to travel sometimes without his family. And you're always like, you, you know, you always say like it's, well, you know. But I know inside, you're super excited. Well, it's nice to have a break, but I definitely do miss them. That's for sure. No doubt. But we do a lot of traveling together too. You guys got a camper. Yeah, we have a camper. RV? So we, RV, so we travel, do quite a bit of weekend traveling, long weeks, long weekend type traveling uh, out in California. Or we'll sometimes we'll go to Arizona or Oregon or something. The great part about California is so much there, close, especially San Diego. 20 minutes to Mexico, two hours to LA, five hours to Vegas, five hours to the Redwoods. It's pretty amazing. Yeah, it's beautiful. I've been out there only once uh, to see you. Um, how many years ago was that? That would have been A like lot. 12 years ago, maybe? Probably. Um, I've always fantasized about owning an RV. How it, badass is it to be rolling in an RV and, and to pick your spots? like? Talk about that a little bit. I, I, I would like to do it someday. I mean, RV life is different. It's it's definitely a lifestyle because you are having to decide where you go, you know, being in closed space with family. I have young kids. My kids, well, they're not, not much older than yours. Mine are 10 and 6. Yeah, 9 so they're and same 6. Age. Yeah, same age. So, um, so, you know, there's like living, you know, in close quarters like that and then... Uh, but it's exciting because, you know, I'm fortunate enough that I'm in a position um, by being self-employed that I can take long trips. I think if it was just two, you know, two dayers, it'd be different. But we're fortunately able to go for a week or two or three. Um, so that makes it more fun. But um, it's definitely a lifestyle. You know, when you go to campgrounds, there's some people there that are campers. They're not just like regular folks. Do they look? <laughs> do, do they eye you up and down? Like you might just be a little too fancy, or maybe your, yeah, your RV's a little yeah, too new. Yeah, because we're we're totally glampers. We're not like roughing it. We have like a fireplace in our camper. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's so bougie. <laughs> I know. Fireplace. What are some of your favorite? Uh, what are some? What are some of your favorite uh, jaunts to take in the RV? I'm, I'm fascinated by this. We we really like the um, Northern California, Pacific Northwest, Oregon. Oregon's beautiful, man. It's really, really beautiful. Um, but anywhere, I mean, I just like going and traveling, doing whatever. We'll we'll go to the desert too. You know, we'll do whatever. So I don't think anything's uh, any place is specifically better than another i think as long as i'm hanging with my kids and my wife it's all good yeah, that's cool you mentioned having the freedom because you're a business owner to sort of create your own schedule uh which might surprise a lot of people they might think oh because you're the business owner you're more tied to it but in fact uh, maybe the opposite is true can you kind of talk about that a little bit well, I mean, you know, it's 2021 and you can do so many things online. So it makes being a business owner a little easier. Uh, you know, my businesses are service based and, um, you know, I've been, been self-employed for 16 years and the three businesses I own now, I've been doing those types of businesses for 12 years. So now I have 
people in place that can help me run those. And then, you know, I have cameras, I have, you know, I can monitor sales, I could ever, everything I can do from my phone. So it makes it a little bit easier. And I've, I feel like I've built a team of people I know that I can trust that can kind of manage stuff for me while I'm gone. So, um, you know, having a great team is like the most important thing. Is that the hardest part? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, you always have your own standard. So are people going to live up to your standard? That's the, that's the challenge. And no one's going to work and no one's going to work your business like you do. So you have to also have some detachment and know that it's just not going to be the same when you're not there. So do you want some freedom? Maybe you lose some sales or maybe there's like some something going on at the business because you're not there. Or do you want to have, you know, be micromanage and maybe it runs a little smoother or differently? I don't know, you know, I'm learning too. I mean, even though I've been doing it a long time, I st- my management style changes, my own tolerance for what I might have taught, to- what I might tolerate now from employees is something maybe I wouldn't, you know, back when I first became a business owner. When I first became a business owner, it was like, it's my way or the highway. And then as you get older and you learn business, you're like, is it really that big of a deal that the guy like uses up all the soap at the state and didn't replace it? <laughs> Just not, you know? <laughs> well, it's like the same thing in our personal lives and our family lives. It's, yeah. it's really easy to get hung up on some petty shit. I am super guilty of that. I feel yep. like I'm extra hard on my oldest son with maybe half of it is petty shit and I have to keep reminding myself and and it's funny man like i don't think it's a big deal i'm like oh well, i'm just yelling about that one stupid thing less but like his whole demeanor is so much different when i take it down yeah a few notches and then the ironic thing is then that thing happens less it's almost like what you put your energy into and your attention on whether mm-hmm. it's positive or mm-hmm. negative magnifies mm-hmm. you know my wife will remind me of that as she fucking reminds me of everything yep um yeah, it's a trip. So sort of that's the trade off is, is maybe slightly less micromanaging so you can have a bit more freedom. Mm-hmm. Well, that's interesting. But you got to have those people you trust, too. You know, I mean, I prefer to hire people at a very the great part about barbering, actually, the barbershop dynamic is you can take someone in as a sweeper, then build to them to an apprentice, then build them to an employee. And so there's a, a little bit of a hierarchy there. And so they're grateful to be moving up. You're giving them an opportunity. They stay loyal. They don't want to go somewhere. They're also, an apprenticeship is a certain amount of time commitment for them. So it makes for a better employee overall. If they um, can stick it out. If they can stick it out. And I mean, I've had great luck with it, fortunately. But I think it's because I run like an, an okay place to be. You know, people want to be there. So, um, you know, it's all, it's it, cause you could have the greatest place, you know, the best barber shop in the world, but if everybody's a fricking douche that works there, I mean, yeah, it's no, just not going to work a hundred percent. So, and so you'd rather have someone coming in green in a way than someone who is an ace. Yeah. Who knows barber. it all. And I don't care about that guy. That's you interesting. Know what I mean, like I want, I want the guy, I want to show him how I do things. Cause I know it works. I don't need like some seasoned guy coming in and bringing all of his baggage and bad experience of other shops <laughs> into my biz and then throwing it off for everybody else too when they say, well, you know how they did it over there? This is how they did it. used to do it at my old shop. That's the worst thing to hear. Yeah, you know. You know, we used to do it. Yeah, the way we used to do it. Is, and you're like, yeah, whatever, dude, you know. So yeah, there's that, you know, so it's it's uh, it's great. And then the, the, the flip side of that with my laser removal business is, the funny thing is, is those employees are like professionals. They're nurses, they went to school, you know, they went to, you know, actual university and then went to nursing <laughs> school. And, you know, so they're like a different type of clientele. They're more, or I'm sorry, uh, employee, they're more, you know, professional in the way that they act, in the way that they dress, in the way that they talk, where the, you know, the barbershop's more loosey-goosey style. So it's a, it's a total different management style too, because I really have to handle things differently in both scenarios as well. So that's interesting because one's a more, obviously a clinical 
Yeah, and ones, yeah. Environment technicians. And the, and the customer also expects a more professional look and environment at one than maybe at the other. So it's a big difference. That's an interesting point. Yeah. So I always remember you. Uh, so, you know, I, I met you probably when I was 15 years old, maybe just turning 15 years old. <laughs> and from the get-go, I remember you as being sort of someone who was entrepreneurial. Where did where did that come from? I mean, I know your dad had a judo school, which yep. he, did he own? He owned it, yeah. Okay, so, so Mark and I were in a band, that's how I met him, and we had the greatest rehearsal studio of all time. <laughs> that uh, was a great- PJK <laughs> judo studio, so <laughs> yeah. his dad had a gigantic judo school out in Matawan? Aberdeen. I'm sorry, Aberdeen. It's just like 20 minutes northwest of here, I guess. And so, yeah, you could just like rehearse in a random room and then there was just trampolines and mats and swords, like all sorts of ridiculous <laughs> shit around. That's right. And it was, I mean, it, it was so key. So yeah. I feel like I benefited from his entrepreneurialism. Yeah. Is that where you learned sort of this idea of having your own business, running your own business, and basically creating the reality that you wanted? Was your dad yeah. a big part of that? I mean, maybe in a sense, yeah, because he was self-employed his whole life. But, um, you know, I, I'm, as you know, I'm just a hardworking type person, you know? So I think for me, I was always too good of an employee and I just thought, you know, after however many years, I was like, I just need to do do this for myself um, I- instead of, you know, working so many hard hours for someone else. Instead of overachieving for someone else. Yeah, exactly. You know, because I always took pride in any job I had, whether it was making pizza at the pizzeria or whatever it was, you know, like I always, I was glad to have a job. I mean, one thing my dad always did take, teach me when I was younger, he was always like, you know, you got to be um, appreciative for any job you have because they're giving you an opportunity. They don't owe you anything. They gave you an opportunity. You know, you owe them to do a good job. So I always, you know, remembered that. So I always wanted to do a good job at whatever I did. So eventually I'm like, I need to do a good job like for me. And so... um that's kind of where I got the idea. And then, you know, it was just trial and error from that point. <laughs> but but even in the band, I kind of feel like I was like a, a business, more business savvy, you know, booking the tours and m- creating merch and, you know, all the things that we did in the band even. A hundred percent. I mean, so I just and that wasn't just a hard, natural. it was not hard to be the leader in that because the rest of us, I'm pretty sure did nothing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we were all operating on a zero yeah. from a business standpoint. Right. Yeah. Not from a creative standpoint. Right. Of course. Of course. Of course. Of course. <laughs> but from a business standpoint, I know I was operating on a zero. I was just happy to be doing something social yeah. and learning how to play my instrument, really, right. and not yeah. suck. So yeah. that was all my focus was going into that. And yeah. yeah, you were the guy who was always thinking about those things. And and it's and you mentioned the pizzeria. Shout out to Berardi's Pizza, and Neptune, yeah. R.I.P. to Berardi's. Yep. If I remember correctly, you were uh, the reigning pizza box maker champion. I think I was. Which is a very clever way of Mr. Berardi to just get a whole bunch of fucking boxes, boxes made. made. Yeah. Who wants to do that? Yep. Did you win anything for that other than no. the prestige? That just the title. Damn. The title was enough. <laughs> and we're talking about it. I mean, that title created. It made me an entrepreneur. <laughs> I wanted to be the best at that. You crushed the pizza box scene. I think I worked there for like a very short amount of time. I think everyone in Neptune, New Jersey worked at Berardi's Pizza at one point. Kind of had to. Yeah, you had to. It was like a rite of passage. Yeah, but this like delivering pizza back in the day prior to having an actual app to tell you where to go, I was just a failure. Well, and back in those days... Neptune was not the safest place to be delivering pizza as well. Might have been a couple sketchy deliveries. There were some pretty sketchy areas. It's not like now where the entire world wants to live in Neptune, New Jersey somehow. It seems really popular. It's very weird, right? We grew up really right near each other, but we didn't realize that until 
um, until I met you. Well, we went to different schools and we were two years difference in age, which in teenage years is an eternity. Well, you still look much, much, much older than me. So let's, yeah. I think it still is an eternity. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I, we went to different schools, yeah. and t- two years apart. We were doing different things. Yeah. I don't know what the hell I was doing. Nothing. I was doing nothing prior to getting involved in music. I was not antisocial by choice. I just think I was naturally pretty uncool. <laughs> it just like lived in my head. <laughs> I thought you my were rep- pretty cool. Well, you obviously had bad taste. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> it was that business mind of yours. I was like, this guy's just good for the band. <laughs> so he's not going to compete with me socially <laughs> right. or sexually. Like he, He's non-threatening. <laughs> It's like, just saw like another lion that was just like walking around the woods. Like, oh, yeah. What the fuck am I doing out here in the Serengeti? You're like, that's the lion <laughs> I want on my team. I want him fighting for all the pride and all this business. That's a uh, oh, that's hysterical. So, who else? Where where else did you see um, entrepreneurialism? You know, I I don't know, man. It was really um, it wasn't until I started doing some personal development like Tony Robbins type stuff that I kind of got the entrepreneurial bug. Talk about Tony Robbins. Uh, I, I feel like he's not as much a name in pop, in pop culture. These days, right? These days. Yeah. But back in the day, he was a big deal. Yeah. Um, I mean, I I'm can, sure he still is. I'm just talking about pop culture, which right. is just a reflection of... I can yeah. honestly say that Tony Robbins programs changed everything for me from my mindset to me like wanting to go get to me being not being afraid to take a chance on myself or you know put myself in a position that I could possibly fail just to to say I did it or whatever um I eventually started working for Tony Robbins in sales I never worked in sales but I had made so many changes in my life personally that um I I was actually doing a goal setting workshop on one of Tony's programs in my car at the beach in San Diego, and the CD case. This was when you listen to that type of stuff on CD, was upside down and had an eight five eight area code phone number, which is local San Diego phone number. And I was like, this is crazy. The office must be here. So I was like, I'm gonna go get a job. And so I took the next day I like put a suit on, which I don't I only own one suit. It's from when I was like 18. Yeah. I have and I drove <laughs> over there and I was like, I'm here for a job. And they were like, what job? And I was like, whatever job you have, I'll take it. I'll work in the mailroom, I'll sweep up, I'll clean, whatever you need me to do. And the, and they were like, We're just not hiring, you know. And at that moment, I guess the sales manager from the sales team was walking through and he's like, can I talk to you for a minute? He t- totally took me in the back and we had a conversation and I said, and he's like, have you ever worked in sales? And I was like, no. And he's like, and I was like, but I'm sure I could sell the product. It changed my life if I believe in it. And he's, and I, and he's like, well, what do you know about sales? I was like, I don't know much, but if you put me with the best sales guy, like I'll figure it out. And so he's like, you know what? We don't have a job for you, but I'm going to create a job for you. And he totally gave me a shot out of nowhere. And then from there, I got, I just became like a top salesperson at the company. And then I traveled a lot with Tony doing the event, working his live events and stuff like that. And then to this day, I still build volunteer on the fire team. We build the fire for the hot coal walk. All right, we got to slow down. Yeah. We got we to tell people. <laughs> We're jumping all over the place, dude. So- I get excited. Oh, it's, yeah. you're, you're tapping into that uh, that Robin's energy. Yeah, no, totally. I, and it, it, and well, we'll get into how it changed my life too, in a way. But um, so a lot of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of the philosophy is really, is really cognitive training. You're training your brain to think differently, yeah. which will allow you to be more fearless. Uh, most of our inhibitions and our failures, or I shouldn't say failures. Our inability to get back up and fight again, it's fear-based. Yeah, it's completely like whatever you're focused on is where your mind goes. Yeah. It's like when you want to buy a new car, you know, and you want to buy the new Tesla or whatever, and it, you specifically want to, you like the blue one, and then you're just, you're thinking about that Tesla, and then you're just seeing it everywhere now. 
because it's just on your mind. Your subconscious is like trying to stay consistent with the thought. So it's the same thing. If you're a negative Nelly type person, then sure, you can wake up and you can go, oh, another dreary Jersey day. Oh, it's not even summer yet. Oh, whereas if you're a more positive person and you wake up and you're like, I'm great, great for it to be alive or whatever positive affirmation type stuff you give yourself, then your mind, subconscious mind tries to find that stuff. No doubt. And so, you know, that's basically the philosophy in a nutshell. And the ability, and so one of the physical tests, because I think it's important to have, you know, obviously you can you can speak your truth, you can speak change, but to put yourself through some kind of physical thing, I think that's how a lot of organizations operate. The military, you know, going yeah, through totally. boot camp, you, you're transformed for many reasons, but one of them is the physicality of it. So you certainly all seen people folks like walking across burning hot coals and uh and not being set on fire <laughs> not uh and, and not injuring themselves i'm sure there are some injuries yeah what is going on when someone goes take us through the the the, the purposefulness of it and the experience of walking across burning hot coals and what that does and, and what the, the symbolism is. The, sure. The, it's funny because fire walking is not so much about fire walking. It's more about being afraid to fire walk, learning how to fire walk without getting injured, injured, and then actually fire walking and then celebrating that you did that too. And so it's not even a matter of if you get burned fire walking because life it's fire walking is like a metaphor for life you can get burned in life too. And so if, you know, it's, so a lot of times people will do the fire walk and I'll see them when they're done and they got a little burn or something because it happens, it does. I've been burned too. I've done 30 something, almost 40 fire walks, like actually done the fire walk uh, and I've been burned. As a matter of fact, the last time I did it, just two, two or three years ago, I was burned too. Not bad, but I got burned and I've done it so many times I should know better. But the fact is, is that I just, I, I knew what to do, but I was so comfortable in it that I just went and didn't do the last step, which is to wipe your feet so that if there's a coal on your foot, you don't step on it on the concrete and then burn your foot. And so I walked, did my thing. I walked. Everything was great. Forgot to wipe my feet. Stepped off the grass because the, the coals are laid out on grass like sod. Stepped off the grass onto the concrete. It was hot coal was stuck to my foot. I just pushed it right into my foot. So even though I had done it so many times, I still did it incorrectly and got burned. So it's not even about like burning, getting burned or not getting burned. It's about like being afraid to do it, mm -hmm. knowing how to do it and doing it. And so because the, you've, you've completed the fire walk successfully, the second you take that first step onto, onto the hot coals, whether you get burned or make it across or not is beside the, is besides the fact. So some people they'll step back after they get on it or step off. No, to the they side. never step back. They usually will. Cause you're supposed to walk at like a steady pace, but they will usually step and then run because they're like, think they're going to get burned. Cause even though they know that the, the way to do it is to walk very evenly paced and you know, so yeah. How are you, how is one protected from the coals? I mean, is it, is there a, I guess what I'm trying to get at, is there a mental aspect that can protect the physical damage? No. Okay. It is literally, the mental part of it is just knowing that if I do it correctly, how I was taught, I will not get burned. So you just have to, to do what you were taught. And it's like anything in life. Everybody knows what to do. They just don't do what they know. It's like, if you're overweight, you know that you have to eat right and exercise. It's not, um, it, there's no secret to it. There's no pill. There's no anything about it. It's just, if you're a drug addict, you know you shouldn't do it. Like everyone knows what to do. It's just, they don't do what they know. So, you know, it's the same. And, and so the firewalk is just a huge metaphor for that. It's like knowing how to do the firewalk like I know and doing it incorrectly like I did the last time and getting burned because I did it the wrong way. I assume the mental aspect could come in with shutting off pain and discomfort i guess but you're I mean, probably so pumped up yeah so your adrenaline, adrenaline is going has be through There's the roof people everywhere they're playing like tribal type drums you know <laughs> like everybody's screaming ah celebrating yeah it's like a whole thing 
So what what uh, what type of transformation do people do, do you see the results after something like that? And how do people describe the results? How do you quantify the results? I know you haven't worked for the company in a bit. Yeah, so. I mean, you just you know, and just like anything else, don't get me wrong. You're not going to go to a Tony Robbins event, do the fire walk, and then miraculously have a changed life. There also is action there. You know, so you many people go to the events, get fired up, go home and live the same way they did before. You know, they're not in that environment where people are cheering for them anymore. So, you know, the, it's like anything. You got to practice it. You know, you got to like really be strong minded. You really got to be wanting to do it or else. Yeah, it's not going to happen. Just like just like how someone can be overweight for years and years and years. And then somehow, miraculously, they get it in their head, I don't want to live like that anymore. And then they do whatever it takes to get to where they want to be. It's not like, so I guess the, you, the times you see the change is when people are either desperate, like they're so low, so they, they go to a Tony Robbins event and it just it's the thing they needed to get out of that lowest spot they've ever been, or they get really inspired and make a change. But any, anyone else who's just kind of there looky-looey, like I used to see like a lot of times some of my clients when I was in sales there, they would say, oh, my, you know, my wife and I are like on the outs and I'm going to send her to the event so that she can change. Mm. And I'm like, it ain't going to work. It's just not how it works. You know what I mean? Like they got to have to go there wanting change. They have to know why they're there. They have to have some purpose, you know. Well, you can't change somebody. You can't change someone. I am constantly I guilty of could. trying to do it and yeah. I'm constantly reminded of how fucking ridiculous and impossible the only thing you could do is change yourself and that's hard enough yeah I mean it's it's uh, you know dude you think there's no one more impressionable in your life than your kids mm. if you were if you were able to change someone it would be your kids because you have more influence over them than anyone and you can't change your kids. Not totally you know what pointless. I mean? Like, if, so then what? I'm now. So what? I'm going to come to forty or forty something year old Mike Scotto and change him because I feel like I want to. No, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, and, and that's and, and having kids is also because then they often become a mirror in many ways. They're their own person for sure, but they're also a mirror of the adults around them. So that so then the trip is you're getting. All your assiest qualities. Yeah, all your bad qualities come out in your kid, and you're like, dang. They're getting thrown back at you, and you're like, fuck. Yeah. So then, like, you know, you try and change that, and that's a joke. You know, it's like, all right, well, that's just something I need to continue to work yeah. on. And, you know, the arc, the arc is slow. The arc is, it's a gentle arc. Mm -hmm. You, you left New Jersey. So we, you know, you and I were great friends. Uh, we had a wonderful run in music. I think as far as a quote unquote local band, we did just about every single thing you can do um, as far as, you know, being a big fish in the pond for a bit, as far as actually getting a record deal, as far as actually leaving our town and playing shows, not just out of the town, but out of the country as well. Um, you had secured a sponsorship, a clothing sponsor sponsorship for us, which I didn't even know was a thing. <laughs> um, we were the kings of merchandise. Like who had more T-shirts and and design stickers, uh, shirts, hats, like jackets, sweatshirts. <laughs> like yeah, we everything. had everything, which we were obviously doing for a reason to help just keep the kitty full and to be able to do the things that we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, of course everything comes to an end all things must pass as george harrison uh said why did you leave new jersey because you just seemed to uh make an abrupt yeah exit uh do you want to talk about that sure yeah i at the time i was going through like not happy with work didn't know what i wanted to do you know i was a very different person before i moved to california well, I don't want to. I don't want to tell it. You, you tell it. <laughs> so I was not like a Tony Robbins happy-go-lucky type guy. I was like not a happy guy. So you know, I was just at a point in my life. I had had some heartbreak, and I was like, I gotta get the hell out of here. Like, there's no nothing for me here except for like being pissed off. 
So I got to get out of here. You were angry. You were an angry, angry just in general person. You weren't always yeah. miserable. I mean, I feel like I, I never got that. Like we had so many good times. Yeah, totally. But definitely, you had it. You had a strong fucking chip. <laughs> like there were a few totally. trigger words, and I would just be like, "Oh boy, yeah, get your face it, ready." And it, you know what's so? <laughs> here comes a fist. I know, I know. It's not. It's not my finest moments. And you know what's so funny is because my wife only knows me like from my from living in California. So sometimes she when we when we come back to visit, she'll hear a story like that from you or whoever, you know? And she'll be like, Really? You were like that? And I'm just like, Yeah, man, it was like a different time. So I think, you know, it was just it was the right time. My buddy Eric Cruz had moved to California and he yeah. had a place for me to stay. He's like, dude, just you can stay at my place. I basically live at my girlfriend's. I have three months left on the lease. I'm paying the rent and I'm not there. Come live there, try it out. If it doesn't work out, you can go back to Jersey. So I went out, car got stolen within two weeks, 50K in credit card debt. Like, yeah, dude, I was in a bad spot. You were starting from a low spot. Really low spot. And you were looking to escape. You were really yeah, looking to I, I escape. Yeah, I was thinking a somewhere different will be different. And it was, you know, and when I got there, I quickly realized like, oh, I'm just in a new place with the same freaking tired ass thoughts that I had back in Jersey. And one less car. And one less car and no friends or anyone, you know, at that time. Yeah, you didn't know. I mean, other than Eric, shout out to Eric. Yeah. I haven't seen him in a million years. I if just you're saw him in Eric, Portland. I saw him in Portland two, two weeks ago. Oh, I went to visit Portland. It was he great. lives there? Yeah, he lives there now. Oh, right on. What's up, yeah. Eric? Yeah. But yeah, so I mean, yeah, it was a crazy time, dude. So I was at, I was there in desperation and uh, out of desperation and totally was kind of forced to make all, all those changes, I think, too. Because Why? I, because you were at a zero point? Yeah, I feel like I was at a low point. I didn't know anybody, so I was forced to meet people. See, the one challenge I find with being living where you're from, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, I think, is um, you're always around the same people no matter what. And sometimes you have association with people that aren't really great for you, but they're part of your friend group. And so you can't really escape them. So what? when I moved to California, I was forced to make new friends, to be in a different friend group, to ha take different jobs, lip find new places and how to get there. And, you know, everything was new. So I think, you know, it was just out of desperation I went there. And then out of inspiration, really, I like started making change because I was like inspired by what was going on out there. It's I different. assume too the idea of going back to New Jersey with your tail between your legs. For lack yeah, of that term. too. Yeah. That was probably for like, sure. fuck. Yeah, for sure. Because I had already done that And I'm sure there was, I... a, there was one or two guys waiting for you when you came back. Yeah, no, I'm sure there was. <laughs> <laughs> there might have been a couple folks. I still got to watch my around my shoulder when I get back to Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a beautiful story, man. And, yeah. and it's it, what's interesting to me is Obviously, you've done all those things, and I always saw all those things in you. Anyway, I mean, I don't, I, I never felt like I was the kind of guy who enjoyed hanging out with an asshole. So I think right. you know, obviously, like anyone else, you're a diamond, multifaceted. Um, but what's interesting to me is, you know, w when you were able to really make those changes in earnest, of course, for yourself, certainly not for anyone mm -hmm. else. That began to then sort of amplify out and and it's it's a trip to me to hear the amount of people who you inspire and the amount of people who and we talk about this this often the amount of people who will you know obviously you're affecting indirectly just by being you but the amount of people who will just probably call you we could think of a couple mm -hmm. people right now mm -hmm. off the top of our head who maybe want to complain a little bit but are just looking for some magic advice right and the advice is always the same, isn't it? Right. <laughs> it is. <laughs> Someone's looking, you know, so many times people are looking for... Um, They're looking just, for the magic pill. Just tell, please, yeah. tell me what to do. Right. Just tell me what the fuck to do. I, I don't know. Tell me what to mm -hmm. do. So I always thought it was really beautiful and, and inspiring and kind of funny too, again, based on what, what you felt you were leaving within mm -hmm. yourself. And I see that all as the same guy. Right. So I think it's also funny how like your California crew and probably a bunch of other people are like, 
yeah, right. Yeah. Like, and we're not even getting into the half of it. Right. Um, so, <laughs> or the third of it. This is a family show. Of course, yeah. I get letters from young children all the time and crayon. It's funny. My mom, um, she, my father's sister, she went down to Florida to visit my folks. And my mom, like, wanted to show off the fact, that, you know, hey, the podcast, she knows it's doing pretty well. And she's proud of me. She's always proud of me. She's great. And she's like, yeah, so I, I just put a random one on. She's just lucky she could locate the computer, right. turn it on, and right. find the YouTube channel. Um, so that's a huge win just for her. She's already winning. And she pops on this episode, and she's like, Michael, it wasn't three or four minutes until <laughs> the F word. And it was embarrassing. Right. So, Mom, I'm sorry. I'm so fucking sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, we are who we are. So, yeah, so I, I embarrassed yeah. her, and I, I probably... Um, well, my aunt... If I remember correctly, she's got a trucker mouth, her and her husband. So yeah, I, I think, Jersey, I, think I need to step it up. It's part of being from Jersey, I think. Totally. totally. It's a total Jersey thing. I get a little suspect of someone who doesn't have um, some uh, some filthy vocabulary. Like, hmm. Yeah, what are you holding in? Guy? I feel like they might freak out at yeah. some point and go on a murderous what rage. You, or what do you think? You're just so special that you don't have to say a cuss word? Come oh, on. Don't let the hate come out. <laughs> Let's, let's the um so yeah i always thought that was interesting how you were then becoming a symbol for other people even even people that even in situations that maybe you couldn't personally connect to so you were never a drinker i don't know if you've ever even had a drink period but then we have a close friend who he reached out to you when he needed a sponsor right for his aa program so like your energy was sort of hitting in so many fields and um, I just always thought that was beautiful. I'm just really proud of you. So I just wanted to. Oh, thank you, man. Wanted to tell that Appreciate and wipe that. off your feet when you get off the fire pit. That's dude. right. I got to learn that. You think I would have learned that after thirty something times? Well, you got cocky. That's right. That's but, exactly what it was. Yeah, I got this. Yeah, I was like, I got it. That's funny. Got burned. When um, when we were coming up and playing music. Uh, I think it's a lost art. I don't know. Maybe it's not a lost art. We basically would just make fun of each other's mothers right. to such an extreme disrespectful level. <laughs> and, and each other, of course. Right. Um, and I, I really hope that never gets lost in society. Sorry, moms everywhere. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, there's something very special amongst fellas. I knew we were going to say some why controversial stuff. Why is it? Because uh, I assume... it. First. Like, why does it hurt your feelings so much about your mom, but not your dad or your aunt? Well, because most of our lives, we want to fight our father. Right. Right? Like I couldn't fight my father, by the way. He was a judo master. He would fuck you up. He would totally kill me. Until my dad got serious back <laughs> problems, he would have just jacked me up, too. His <laughs> forearms were like Popeye. <laughs> always had a hammer in his yep. hand, and he was had severe pent up Dude, rage you want to know what's something funny that i always think about your dad and i don't know why i have one t-shirt <laughs> that has it's a t-shirt with a pocket yeah and i every time I, I rarely wear the thing but i see it all the time in my you know in my closet and i'm always like neil scotto would have wore this shirt my dad had a uniform i feel like he only i've only ever seen him with a pocket t is that right, or am I just yeah. remembering it No, you're remembering it exactly right, and it goes much further than that. He wore the same shit every day for most of my life. A black <laughs> that's, t-shirt. That's what it is. It's that. Black t-shirt yeah. with the pocket and jeans, either jeans, shorts, or long jeans. He wore that shit every day to the point where I think there was a surprise 40th for him. I guess I'm going way back. Surprise 40th. And... All of us at the party wore all that. wore black t-shirt with a pocket and fucking jeans. Love it. And he had the he had the menthol cigarettes in there. He smoked cools for a million years nice. until he quit cold turkey. Good for him. Like that. Of course, he still, I mean, it got to the point where my mom would kick him out of the house. So he wasn't allowed to smoke in the house anymore. But he would still go outside and act like he was smoking just to make sure he could do it. He probably did that for a couple weeks. Right. Before he's like, oh, by the way, I quit and I haven't had a cigarette in X amount of weeks. And he's so funny. He's like, it wasn't because I wanted to. 
He's like, I love smoking. <laughs> he was so real. He is real. Yeah. He's like, I love fucking smoking cigarettes, but I'm just tired of hearing it. Yeah. I'm tired of, uh, you know, my mom yeah. was probably nagging him forever. Yeah, for years. Anytime we had a cough. I mean, I had chronic uh, strep throat each year for many years. I'm sure it was because of the cloud. I'm 100% sure of that. In the yeah. house, and my dad would have these, he'd have these epic card games in the house. He he uh, he ran with a with an interesting crew, and uh, and they would play these card games. I don't know how often it was. Maybe it was just once a month, but they would play for like, days at a time it wasn't like hey we're playing cards tonight it's like we're playing cards this weekend and they would just go straight right. through and i don't think they were like into coke or anything so i don't know how these motherfuckers <laughs> stayed awake I, they might take turns like nodding off and taking right. naps i remember seeing that reflected and i saw so many things in my family reflected in the sopranos it's ridiculous but i remember watching they clearly would have those like multi-day card games right. and i'm like that yeah. that would happen at my house. Yeah. Everyone's smoking. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there was the one guy, Jimmy the Greek. Jimmy the Greek was like the snack master. And so if we knew Jimmy the Greek was coming over, we're like, <gasps> so we'd have to, my brother and I would try and hide all the snacks because he'd just go in like, ah, like, you know, every, all <laughs> Oh, the... I thought you were going to say he brought all the snacks. Dude. No, he was taking all the snacks. Nobody brought anything there except for cigarettes and the money that they were playing with. And potty mouths. Yeah, potty mouths, of yeah. course. Yeah, fruit roll-ups, gone. The chewy granola bars, gone. Chips Ahoy, forget it. If there was Girl Scout cookies, pff, they weren't making it. Dude, Jimmy the Greek. I don't know what he's doing these days, but I hope I hope you're happy with yourself, Jimmy, because you ate everything in our house every time. <laughs> you have multi-day card games. It was so funny. Um... One of the things, I, what do we start talking? Oh, making fun of mothers. Let's get right, right back into that because okay. that's what people want to hear. I right. want, want everyone to be comfortable. You would dog my mom about being like religious and playing guitar, like in the folk group at church, playing like Christian music. Right. That was like my biggest target. Was that like? Yeah, but that was the worst thing you could say about your mom. I mean, other than that. It's not like we would say anything else about your mom. So that's not such a bad burn. Come on. <laughs> it's not such a bad burn at all. <laughs> I could think about some of the other moms. Yeah. Um, <laughs> at any rate, that was the burn uh, for my mom. And then uh, all these years later, and then there you are. I see you out there in India. Yep. Krishna chanting, hitting bells. Yeah. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm busting your balls, but... How, how did that transition happen for you? How did you sort of make a, um, I mean, I don't want to say the word religious because it implies like so many things. And sure. I, uh, how did that sort of spiritual transformation happen? If you don't mind talking yeah, about no, it. Yeah, no, totally. I, um, you know, I got introduced to Krishna consciousness through the hardcore scene with the bands like Shelter and 108 back in the in the days when we were playing music. So well, explain I, that to people. There was a whole movement. Yeah, so there was, you know, Mike and I, we played in, the, in, in a hardcore band. And uh, in that scene, there was kind of a sub-scene of uh, bands that were also punk slash hardcore bands that were also preaching Krishna consciousness. So I had initial exposure through that, but I wasn't so much into it actually at the time. I just thought that's kind of peculiar, but whatever. It's punk rock. I mean, there's nothing right or wrong, and um, and but but you know, I I I already had a lot of those uh, lifestyle traits. I was drug and alcohol free for my whole life. I was a vegetarian um, and, and different things like that. I you know tried to lead a more positive lifestyle, especially once I got to California. So it was very natural. I think, you know, one of the things about moving to California too is I was like, there's got to be more than just like... And then, you know, ironically, when I started having some material success and with my businesses and things, I really started to realize like there's got to be something more than just like getting a bunch of stuff. So um, Krishna consciousness, you know, resonated with me because I had some connection to it in my teen years. And um, I just like the philosophy of it, you know? Um, and yeah, so I, I kind of naturally was drawn to it because my, my own lifestyle was kind of like that already. 
talk about the philosophy. So what? Sure. What about the? Can we call it a religion? Like I don't even know. Sure, I don't want to use the wrong words. Yeah, so what sure. about the religion's philosophy, specifically? Um, you know, I oh, I was never raised any religion. I didn't go to church as a kid. Um, I did go to church with my best friend Tina a lot to Catholic Church at Holy Innocence. Shout out your alma mater, I think. And you go there, Holy Innocence. Yeah. That's right, baby. And um. So I just had a little bit exposure to Christianity or Catholicism. I never really resonated with me. Um, the concept of we're not the body, that we're the energy that runs the body, and the body is something that comes and goes with time, and your soul takes birth in different bodies based on karma, just made sense to me. So I, you know, I was just thinking like, you know, there, I, there's got to be something new out here. Um, or so, you know something different for me be, than than just having some material success because I wasn't finding any like real happiness in it. Like I was naturally good at it. I'm I'm, I'm able to rally people together and lead. It's very natural for me. And another thing in Krishna consciousness too is not um, you know contrary to pro popular belief because most people think of the Hare Krishnas they think of the guys with the ponytail, you know, chanting in the street and being monks. But in actuality, it's just a small portion of um, people in, in, in bhakti yoga or Krishna consciousness. And the rest of us are just regular people doing our thing. And so what you're, what you're learning in, in bhakti or in Krishna consciousness is that you take what you're good at and you use it in service. Uh, service to the entire community, cer certainly in service to God. And so... Um, yeah, it just kind of it kind of sparked something in me that I never really knew was there. Um, I love reading spiritual books. I find them very fascinating and interesting. There's answers to every question in there, just as as there would be for a Christian reading the Bible. Um, and yeah, it just it kind of made sense to me. Just like when anybody chooses to follow a path of anything, it doesn't even have to be religious or spiritual. The idea no. of, you know, we are not our physical selves. We are a spiritual being that is, you know, part of for some time or trapped in, depending which way. That's not novel to Krishna consciousness. I mean, that's pretty much a tenet of most religions. Right. So what was it this idea of karma and reincarnation that spoke to you more, which definitely is specific to that and Hinduism. Am yeah. I saying, am I? Am yeah, I it's like correctly? a sect of Hinduism, you okay. know, just like how Christianity has Methodist, Baptist, Catholicism, whatever. It's yeah, the yeah, same yeah, type yeah, of thing, yeah. kind of thing with Hinduism. But, but yeah, I mean, the, yeah, that, that, you know, uh, be, be, you know, your karma is creating your next body. And so if, for instance, if you're a meat eater, for instance, uh, that your, your next body, you could potentially take birth as an animal uh, and it's your turn to get the slaughter or whatever. Um, it just makes more sense. And, you know, on a more practical level, just like being a good person, you know, there's really bhakti, which is what Krishna consciousness is, is, uh, is it means love. And, uh, you know, what we're learning in this philosophy is, is that we have to love all beings, not just human beings, but all beings, plants and animals and everything else. And so, you know, one, one uh, thing that the founder of the Krishna movement said in a speech one time was that, you know, as soon as you find difference in people is when everything goes awry. You know, I'm American, I'm... Pakistani, I'm white, I'm black, I'm male, I'm female. As soon as you create that other person that's different from you is when all the challenges start. And so in Bhakti, we're learning that, you know, we're all spirit soul, everyone. Everything else is just based on your karma. You were born into a, into a American body or you were born into an Indian body or you were born into a tree body or an animal body just based on your pri pr previous and prior engagements. So it just made sense for me. And That's maybe, all. And it also correlates, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, to, to your own transformation. Exactly. You know, leaving New Jersey, leaving that body, so to speak, and reinventing yourself, which was a result of your karma, I suppose. You, you certainly would not have left this area, I assume, if everything was rocking and rolling and you were feeling 
maybe not like stoked all the time, but satisfied. Right. You wouldn't have been able to make that transformation. So things happen for a reason. Yeah, totally. And that's the reason you did that. So maybe it's also just a, the religion is almost a mirror of your, the experience that you had lived a few years prior. Yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a, when you really zoom out in life, you realize that, you know, that there's a reaction and opposite reaction to everything that happens, you know? So I think that, um, it, I, I don't know. I find it's hard to explain because I find bhakti yoga or Krishna consciousness just so practical that, um, just as a lifestyle, let alone a spiritual practice, it just makes so much sense. Treat everyone great. Doesn't matter where they're coming from, you know? Treat everyone with respect. Don't worry about what they're wearing. Don't judge them. You know, these are very basic principles that you find in all religions, really. I think for it's sure. just, you for know, sure. it's packaged into what makes sense for each person, you know. And that's another thing I really love about Krishna consciousness. There's never, you know, there's always this thing like anyone that's on a spiritual path, you should always encourage them to be on that path. Ne never discourage because there's no converting anyone anyway how can I can you're already a spirit so I can't convert you to it well we talked about that before yeah like you're trying to change someone yeah that's... you just can't do it you know and by me saying it's my way or the highway isn't going to help it's not going to make me want to do it well, it's usually institutions that do that I, I find yeah. that so many religions get a bum rap because the institution the the brick and mortar and hierarchy of the institution is often has nothing to do with the the people who are trying to lead good lives same thing with governments Totally. Right. So like, you know, the, the American, the U.S. government has had some highs and lows over the years, but it doesn't always reflect right. on the citizenry. Right. I, I, I have identified with my government and I have sharply not identified right. with my government, but I still feel like, well, I'm a citizen of this country and I'm yeah. a human being. And I think it's the same. It's the same thing with religion. And I like how you said, uh, you know, being able to sort of zoom out. So many things allow you to zoom out. I think a lot of ignorance comes from not not having the opportunity to zoom out. Um, for me, it was getting to travel, get the hell out of town and just see other places. It was taking acid one time. like That vastly changed my, um, my perspective, particularly on the connection to nature. Mm -hmm. So I feel that there is a spiritual aspect to psychedelics too, even though I haven't really done a, a lot of research <laughs> in that field, but the, the tiny amount that I did when I was young was, it was huge. And I think for religion, it's the same thing, traveling. I mean, you can't, again, you can't force someone to, to experiment w with life, but it, it's always positive to be able to zoom out and it's it's kind yeah, of a you, bummer when most of the times because people seem to fight against that well it's so funny because like you know when you when you look at a group of people that maybe you know have an opinion in one cer sort of way like it, it, I, so we have some people that we help in our program at the laser clinic that we treat them for free. They're ex-gang members or they've been human trafficked or something. So they all have incredible stories. They all have overcome. They're in different place in their life. But there's one guy in particular who was part of like the Aryan Brotherhood in, in jail. And, you know, he was saying, you know, one day he was talking and he was just, you know, spewing his... Uh, political beliefs and I don't try not to get involved. It's a place of business, whatever. But some things, they get out of line. I can't have it at my shop too. You know, I got to like say, hey man, it's just not the place. But, you know, he was saying, you know, something about, you know, well, I'm not a racist person anymore, but you know, like I'm pr really proud of being white. And I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, why though? You, you didn't do anything to be, you just happened to be born that way. Like, you could have been born black. You could have been born Jewish. You could have been born anything. You didn't do anything. Like, what's there to be proud of? It's a tricky thing because yeah. also, I mean, you'd have to spend a lot of time with someone, right? I mean, you're talking about probably in a clinical office. Right. They're getting a swastika taken off their chest. Right. Um, <laughs> some, ar some lightning bolts exactly. taken off their arm. Dude, oh my God, that's yeah. amazing. But like, you know, what do they mean by that? I mean, how would you define pride? 
because I'm very proud of my heritage. I'm proud of Italian American heritage, but I could describe it maybe differently differently than he would. So it's, yeah, it's almost like, I what does he mean by that? that? And that's the context of it. The context was not that, you know, oh, I've, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm a Viking ancestry and this is, you know, it was just like, he was saying it, I'm proud, meaning I'm better. And so, you know, I'm thinking like, but why, how? Like, tell me how. I didn't say it, but I'm just thinking that, you know. I'm like, oh, you're not going to fuck me. with the guy who just got out of jail no. and has a swastika still on nah, his chest. I'm not, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> but, you know, like, the yeah, it, it's just it just seems silly, you know, when you when you think. And, you know, it's the same thing with, like, you know, a lot of times people will go, you know, I, I, I'm into spirituality. I'm just not, like, into organized religion. And I, and I think that that's a funny term, too, because I'm like, well, what would you be into? Like, unorganized religion? Or like, I mean, because as soon as like you and I decide we like to read Bhagavad Gita and then I go, dude, come over at eight o'clock. Let's read it together. And then, oh, this other guy, he wants to read it too. And well, now it's organized, you know? So I think it's funny. And you made a good point in saying that, you know, it's the, it's the institutions a lot of times and it's not, and it even goes more micro than that in that it's individuals within institutions that create a bad rap. With, well, yes, every institution yeah. is composed right. of uh, of individuals, of course. But right. what I mean by that is the top of the hierarchy, the rule makers, the money holders, the uh, the people in power. Power, right. power, of right. course, ultimately uh, distills to human beings. Yep. It's, it's not a it's it's a human construct. Yeah. Totally, that's interesting. So you've been to India yeah. twice. Three, Three times. times? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Maybe talk about like the first time you went, why you went. Was that part of the Krishna consciousness experience? Yeah. I mean, I went there for that. Uh, I didn't, I don't try not to go there as a tourist. I like to go as a pilgrim, you know, like on a pilgrimage, going to holy places and living like holy people. Um. And because, yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, everything you think about India is exactly what it is from good to bad. It's very spiritual. It's very stinky. It's very uh, bright and colorful and it's very dirty. Um, so, yeah, you have, I think that if you were just like a regular person who was not into some kind of Eastern philosophy and you went there, you may just see it through the lens of, uh it's just a dirty place that smells and it's overcrowded. Whereas if you're going there as a pilgrim, you're, you're, in your, you're, you're learning about this place and these people that were here in the history, it's a much different experience. So uh, in all honesty, if I was single, had no kids and no responsibility, I would live in India. I love it there. Why? I love the simplicity of it. I love the, uh, the people. I love the food. I love the culture. Of course, I love the spiritual p part of it. Um, but mainly because, you know, with business ownership comes a lot of in your head all the time. You know, I'm, I'm like I say, like I have the freedom to go camping for a long period of time. And physically, my physical body, I can take it and go, no problem. But my head is always in what's going on, what's happening over there. Did show, so and so show up for work? Are these two getting along while I'm gone? You know, uh, did the air conditioner break? You know, all those. And then you also get calls on that stuff. So I'm trying to enjoy time with my family, but they're calling me. Hey, the AC is out. What should we do? Who do we call? You know, what? You know, that type of thing. So. Um, India for me is a place one when I go there I can't get those calls they just you can't get calls so that's great um, but yeah I mean you know like I met a man there he was selling mango I think I told you the story right and he was selling mango and and we were chatting he spoke a little bit of English our friend speaks Hindi they were speaking together and uh, he was asking me about America and what it's like to live here. And, I, and, you know, we were chatting and then somehow it came up about living situations because I noticed that he lived right at his mango cart. Like it was right behind his cart. It was just a little like hut. 
And uh, somehow, you know, I said, well, you know, but it's very expensive to live in America, especially in California. And he was like, what do you mean expensive? And I was like, well, you know, you have to pay a mortgage and you have rent, you know, you have electricity bill. And he gave a look like, I just don't understand. Like, you just, don't you just stay like right here? Like, can't you just stay where you work? And I was like, no, <laughs> you know? And uh, come to find out he was a fifth generation uh, mango salesperson, uh, fifth, fifth generation person to use the cart that the mangoes were on. And his son, he was very proud to say, would be the sixth generation mango guy. And I said, oh, but haven't you ever wanted to like go and see what's out there? And he's like, no, everything I have is right here. I got my family. I got my friend. He sells bananas, two, two, two things down. And I said, what about why? So how come you don't sell bananas? And he's like, oh, because he sells the bananas. I sell the mangoes. And I was like, and, and no one's, the, the mango salesman a quarter mile down the road isn't selling them for less than the, him either. It's just everybody's there and they're looking out for each other and they, you know, they take the little bit of money they make. They, they have, get a little piece of clothing once a year or something and they donate half to their temple and, uh, and that's it. Very simple. And they spend all day with their family and it's very nice. So, you know, I think like I wouldn't go to India and live in Delhi and work at a barber shop in Delhi, but I would love to live there as a resident of a village where there's not much going on. What you described is really one of the one of the big differences and I don't mean that in a negative way between sort of western eastern ideology. Uh, you described collectivism. So well, I'm part of a group, and I think the one of the, I think one of the greatest things to come out of Western culture, and sure, it has a lot of downside mm -hmm. too, is is the idea of the individual. I celebrate that mm -hmm. totally, so, but that that's a huge difference between cultures. Um, both can run afoul, and and both can lead to happiness mm -hmm. for certain, but there's definitely a huge difference. Um, in those cultures, correct me if I'm wrong, I mean, the, the idea of the individual is really not part of the landscape of thinking. Yes, yes. In a sense of there's a caste system and things like that, uh, yes. But there's also, and it's just my, from what I'm observing, of course I can't speak for anyone that that's from there or lives there, but there's not a want for something different too. You know, it's not like, it's not like I could say to him, hey, I, I have this RV and I, I go to the Redwoods and I take my kids and we have a fireplace in there and we can watch movies. Like, that's just not even on the radar. They don't, they're not interested in it. They don't have experience with it. Um, so of course my experience there would also be different if I moved there from my current life where I, am doing these things, you know, creating businesses, you know, but I'm saying like, like it'd be really nice to go a hundred percent opposite of the way my lifestyle is now. And so, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. There's not a lot of individualism there, but I don't know that I think it's a very American thing to think you want to be an individual too. Well, it's, and, it's, uh, a, it's yeah. a long, there's a long history of that just in Western culture, period. You know? And that's what capitalism is, right? I mean, it's like, I'm going to be better than, I'm going to, I'm going to have a better barbershop than the next guy or I whatever. I think it's a product. You know? I think it's a byproduct of capitalism. So for example, like in China right now, clearly from a capitalistic standpoint is kind of taking over that sphere of mm -hmm. at least the. I put this in air quotes, the success of it, yet culturally is, is not about the individual. Right. So who knows how that'll play out? I, I, think, I think it's more of a byproduct. And in business, I mean, there's a million ways to run a business. I mean, you described a wonderful way. I do my best managing the studio here. I'm not the owner of the studio, clearly, so I'm not on the hook for everything, but almost everything mm -hmm. on the day to day and the, and you, you 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 realize day in and day out there's there's always 
a million ways you could handle this situation. Like I had a really tough situation with a client on the phone today and I was fired up and I was emotional and I, you know those conversations where yep. someone, you know, I was, you know, you're being accused of certain things like nefarious intentions and all this, and you're like, you don't know me. And, yeah. But ultimately people are just upset about something mm -hmm. and you're constantly confronted with, well, there's a few ways you could handle this. And I talk about this with my kids all the time. Like you, there's always a choice with how to handle it. doesn't mean you're gonna choose correctly. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> you're definitely not. Most so I, of the I think, time you won't probably. <laughs> so it kind of comes back to the individual, how yeah. you want to, um, yeah. I guess, exercise your capitalistic uh, tendencies or the structure. I think it's still a, a good social construct. I yeah. do amidst all of its flaws. I like the idea of competition. Does it always work out that way? No, but that, that's, that's a longer conversation. Yeah. That's a much longer conversation. Yeah. You brought, dude, you brought me some gear. You brought Three me a things. gorgeous hoodie. So I don't know if y'all can see this. Pappy's Pappies. Neighborhood Barbershop, Poway. I said it you right. said right? it right. Yes, Poway and College Area. Brought me a tea. I brought you nothing. That's okay. You got me, I got water right here. That's all I need. Oh, I got you that water. Yeah. I got you water and a mango stand. <laughs> and here's the <laughs> Here's the t-shirt. If anyone, if any of you guys are out in uh, California and San Diego area, I highly recommend you get a cut at Pappy's Barbershop. Quick story, back in the day, you often romanticized the idea of a barbershop. You're like, man, one day I just want to be an old guy in a barbershop, just one of those like, you know, just talking trash and yep. just having fun coming in and out. And there's definitely a mystique around hair salons and barber shops like it, it's such an interesting thing how they are it's, it's such one a of the social it's, it's one of the only social places left and when i say that i mean it in every sense of the word because there is it's the only place that you will sit for a half hour and talk no phone you can't look at your phone when you you're getting your haircut you're gonna get cut you, we're gonna talk and i think that's why um, I personally had success as a barber in the beginning because, you know, I was, people were forced to talk to me. And, and so, uh, you know, I was good at communicating and reading how people, some people don't want to talk to at the barbershop, by the way, which you also have to know, you know, if you're asking them, Hey, how's your day going? It's very like, good. Oh, well, are you married? Yes. Then, you know, like this guy just <laughs> wants to get his hair cut and get the hell out of here. So there's a skill to it. But, um, you know, I think that especially I have younger kids by the college where my shop is and they don't, they're just not used to having a conversation for a half hour straight. I don't know that I have a half hour straight conversation with my wife in a given day <laughs> straight. You know what I mean? So I think that they, people come and they get this experience. They're just not getting anywhere anymore. And it's like a, I hate this term, but I'm going to use it. It's like a safe kind of, it's like, yeah. you know, you can kind of say anything. Oh, I people mean, tell me all kinds of stuff. I don't want to know. Like I didn't grow up around barbershops or anything like that, but like I knew it from like black barbershops yeah. and having like black friends who would like yeah. talk about like the scene yeah. at a barbershop. And I've been into one or two of those places just personally. And, and you just instantly get the vibe. You're like, oh, this is, this is a great scene. And yeah. I assume for for fancier hair salons. Yeah. I know my wife has had some experiences. Yeah. It's the same thing. You, totally. you can just kind of, you could just let it fly. And Barbershop is, is great, man. I love it. It's really a fun business to be in. It's a, it's a great group of people. To be, you get to make people feel good. You know, they come in, they're looking scrubby and you get, and they tighten them up and they flip them around and you tell them, oh, this looks great on you. And that's, it's amazing. It's a great, great job in that way. And then plus being able to, you know, apprentice, uh, uh, barbering is very old school in the sense that you have to apprentice to become a barber. Uh, and so you're actually learning from someone who knows more than you and they're, and they're building you up. They're teaching you how to talk. They're teaching you how to manage. They're teaching you how to cut. They're teaching you how to do everything. Teaching you how to be a man. Teaching you how to like treat people right. And so it's very cool uh, like that. And um, yeah, I mean, barbering has been just so good to me in so many ways, not just financially, but like in so many ways, just learning about people and being able to really help people come up. Now I have a, 
a, a, a former client who became my apprentice, then became my employee, and then now is my business partner in a barbershop. So co-owning it with you. Co-owning it with me. So how cool is that? Well, it's the full circle. It's a full circle. So it's like really, really cool like that. So yeah. That's like a theme. That's a theme for you, man. Um, this idea of, of coming full circle and, and change and growth. Uh, I love that about you. Uh, I've always loved that about you. Uh, whatever incarnation of Mark <laughs> Bennett we're talking about, I've always loved you. I appreciate you coming on the show, man. If you're in California, please check out Pappy's Barbershop. Um, and also um, San Diego Laser Removal Services if you need to get rid of that swastika, um, <laughs> which was clearly a bad idea. And dude, I gotta say thank you for, first of all, for inviting me on here because you have some like pretty cool people on here and I'm just like a nobody from San Diego. But also because you've been my friend all these years, I really, really appreciate that. Haven't, I, I think I told you the last conversation we had, the one downfall of moving to California and living in California is I don't have a real friend group out there. I have employees, I have acquaintances, I have people I'm friendly with, my kids, friends, parents, but I don't have like real friends out there. So I gotta say thank you for friendship all these years and inviting me on and thinking that anybody would care about my story. Well, <laughs> you're pretty cool in my book. <laughs> thank you. All right, brother. Hey, thanks for tuning in. That's our show. Goodbye. Hare Krishna.